Hey, welcome back to another uh, another session of the Addiction and the Three Principles. Uh, my name is Greg Suki. We're here with Sally Wise today. Uh, I met Sally, I think, about two years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. I think it's been about two years, and uh, I've really, uh, really enjoyed my my conversations with her. And, and she's she's up to a lot of a lot of really good things uh, with the Three Principles, uh, especially around addiction and uh, working in prisons and just really, uh, really helping a lot of people. And uh, she has a, an amazing story to share. Um, and that, that's why I wanted to bring her on today. This is, uh, to me, the, the real hope of the three principles is a recovery that, that isn't a struggle. You know, once, once you get it, it's, there's a real freedom to it. And there's no, uh, you know, I don't have to go to meetings. I don't have to, you know, all these ritualistic things every day that people tend to do to try to stay sober. Um, and I, I did that for a few years in AA and it just, it, I never found any peace and happiness with it. I was, I didn't, you know, I was abstinent, but the, the rest of my life was just in shambles. And it, it wasn't until I came across the three principles that my life really changed for the better. And, and I found that peace of mind and contentment and the, uh, the struggle just disappeared. And I, I know uh, Sally has experienced uh, the same type of thing, and I, I'd love to hear, um, love her to share her story here, and then we'll get into some discussion. So now to you. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I'll just show us, share my story of my addiction and then my transformation. Um, and for those of you who heard it before, I'm sorry, but it's uh, I just want to share from the beginning, really. So um, I had my first drink when I was five years old, when my parents uh, were having a, a, a party for chilled with alcohol. Um, they were big drinkers. And they'd got a lot of friends round, and my mum announced that um, she had tried to abort me when she was pregnant with me uh, with a bottle of gin and a hot bath. And I can remember sitting there feeling totally rejected and unloved, frightened, scared. Um, and apparently that day I went round picking up drinks of alcohol. I'd witnessed the adults drinking and that was the first day I got drunk age five. Um, around that time I'd started becoming very anxious and my mum put it down to me starting school, infant school and I believed her and she said that the teacher at, in my first year of school was very cruel to me and I'd become a very very anxious child. So I was put on tranquilizers age five um, these things I've learned since you know in my teenage years anyway my real addiction started when I was 17 and when I met my first boyfriend and we used to go to the pub seven nights a week and even at that young age I always had to have five drinks five halves of lager it was at the time to try and give me this feeling of confidence and ease, um, especially being around older people. Um, and that became habitual, seven nights a week. That was it uh, for, well, until I was two years, two and a half years ago, seven nights a week. But then that progressed into lunch times at the weekends and I very quickly found that a hair of the dog worked really well for a hangover. So I was having five halves of lager at lunchtime at the weekends and then my five at night and then Saturday and Friday nights a lot more. Um, I went to college and got a diploma in science and I had a good job in a, a college near here where I was the senior science technician with a lot of responsibility. Um, but my drinking was affecting the mornings at work, you know, I often felt poorly and didn't want to go into work. Um, but in that career, 
I managed quite well. And then in 2000, I took voluntary redundancy and went and became a microbiologist for Seven Trent. And the culture there was to go drinking at lunchtime just once a week. But with, with a lot of cajoling from me, I got the whole team to come down five days a week. And a lot of them would just drink water or one beer. Um, but I gradually progressed to three pints of cider every lunchtime. And then I'd get home from work and start my drinking session, which had now progressed to probably two to three bottles of wine a night, almost to oblivion. Um, just to try and get this feeling that I used to have of, of confidence and dis-ease uh, the disease I was trying to get rid of, sorry, I was trying to fix the disease. Um, and that progressed and progressed. Um, anyway, I left that job mm. and went into a, a, another job. It doesn't really matter, but my drinking just took over my whole life. I don't actually remember the day that I had my first drink in the morning before work, but that's when everything started to fall apart. I was drinking to try and stop the shakes to get to work and that was driving to work. So I'd often arrive to work drunk um, and then I'd proceed to drink all through the day. Every occasion I could, I'd get out of work for an hour, half an hour, even 10 minutes just to keep topping up the alcohol. Um, my health was deteriorating badly and mentally. Um, you know, I was le losing the plot, really. I was um, seeing things, hearing voices. And it, it was just perpetual drink, drink, drink. I didn't eat anything all day. I didn't drink any other uh, liquid apart from alcohol. I never drank water, tea, coffee, nothing. Um, and gradually, everything started to crash down around me. Like that, I joined AA by then because that's the only way I thought I could stay sober. And they said that the yets would come and I didn't know what the yets were. Um, and the yets were that I lost my job. I lost my driving license. I got a criminal record. I lost all my friends. I lost my family. Uh, more importantly, my health and my mental capacity was totally gone. Anyway, um, in over the years, I've attended eight treatment centres, which has cost me about £80,000, which was money that I'd inherited. But I just wanted to be well. Anyway, in 2014, I was rushed into hospital where I had acidosis and hypothermia and apparently I had minutes to live but that didn't stop me drinking as soon as I came out I started again I was caring for my mum de with dementia and finding it very difficult to deal with that and my drinking so in 2014 December I went to a treatment centre in Southampton where they allowed me to take my dog and I took her there and I had to actually have two full uh, detoxes, one after the other for two weeks. And I saw a psychiatrist who said I'd got the broad gate walk because I couldn't walk anymore either. And after uh, four weeks in there, I came out, but I'd still got the addictive thinking, um, you know, when was the next drink going to come? Well, when this happens, of course, I'll need a drink and I'll never get through that without a drink. So it was all when it was going to happen, which was very scary because I was still what they call white knuckling my sobriety. So I threw myself totally into AA and thought the only way is to get a sponsor and to do the steps, which I started doing. And then I was introduced to a lady called Jacqueline Hollows. Um, and she was a life coach. And I'd had counselling for 20 years for my addiction in a local addiction service here. 
and I just thought she was another counsellor, but I was willing to try anything. So I started seeing Jacqueline once a week, and she wasn't like any other counselling I'd ever had. Um, she didn't tell me that I was broken. She didn't tell me that I had a disease, which I'd been told I was born with a disease of addiction, which I believed. Um, and she said that I was well and that I was okay. And I, I just couldn't believe that, that she was saying this. And I said, but you don't understand. I have been drinking for 35 years for seven days and I am broken. And she gradually encouraged me to do baby steps in my life, challenges without a drink. And over the months, I started to learn to sit with the feelings, which I'd never been able to do since the age of five. And then I got confident that the feeling would pass without me fixing it with anything, uh, you know, a substance of alcohol. And my confidence grew and I started doing more. Um, I went on a training with Jack Pransky and did the extended practitioner training because I wanted to do as much of the three principles as I could. And it was just the realisation that every experience I'd had for the past 40 years, 45 years, had purely come from my thinking. I had no idea that my thinking had anything to do with my feelings and my experiences. I always blamed the outside. You know, this person did that, that did that, I've lost my job. And it was always somebody or something else's fault. And when I realized that it was actually coming from me, all from me, 100%, it gave me this great feeling. in the early days and I used to let them just pass through and not cling on to that thought of a drink and build and build it into a big story. I felt found if I just acknowledge the thought and try and let it go it sounds really really hard um, and it, in the beginning it, it was difficult but it was having I felt like I suddenly had a choice about my thinking and eating is to me is just just the same um you know it's your thought of the eating and then you obsess your your thinking becomes obsessive about the eating um and it's the actual carrying it through um when you don't need to and you don't need to fix that feeling that you've had that you're trying to fix Um, can I just add one thing about that? Yeah. Um, in my own experience, um, and as well as sort of being in the field of nutrition and fitness, uh, you know, there's also the physiological, the sorry, the biochemical piece to that is like, you know, it's not it, for me, um, and sort of it's more than just thinking, it's actually a physical thing happening, you know, when we sort of spike our you know, the insulin levels, the drop, the spike, the drop. I mean, there's, there's dealing with that, that it's a real thing too, that's not just all made up in our thinking. I think that's important. And, you know, not to use that as, okay, well then, you know, I can't do anything about it, but just to know that it's actually really something going on in our bodies, right? That that, so that drives that craving. Yeah, it might, I mean, obviously, if it's, it's if you've had no nutrition, um, then you, you need to feed yourself and you need to drink water, you know, that, that's, but it's when it, it then becomes, well, I'll, I'll have more to eat and I'll, oh, if I have more and more and more and more, and it just becomes, then it's into obsessive thinking. It's not a requirement of our nutrition. Mm -hmm. But one thing, um, <clears throat> I had an insight when, because obviously when you're drinking and you're drinking heavily, you can't just stop drinking because there is a physical addiction and alcohol is the only drug you can die from by withdrawing um so you need to be sober before you know anything but i 
when I used to go and get my um, alcohol first thing in the morning, I would have a couple of drinks just to be able to get out of my front door. And all the way to the shop, my thinking would be 100%, will the lady sell it to me? Have I got enough money? How much shall I buy? What if she knows I'm drinking, won't sell it to me? And by the time I got to the shop, I was in such a panic I would be shaking from head to foot. Now, I thought that was alcohol withdrawal, which I couldn't understand because I'd already had a few drinks to get me out of the door. And what I did notice when I was doing that is as soon as the lady in the shop had taken the money, given me the full bottle of alcohol, and I had it in my hand safely, the shaking would stop and I hadn't even opened it. And through the three principles, I saw that it was my thinking, the obsessive thinking before I got to the shop that had got me into this physical situation of shaking. But eating, yes, of course, you have to have nutrition. But it's it, to me, it's the, it's the obsession of thinking that you carry on and on and on. And fixing the feeling, um, you know, some people will go on a binge to try and make themselves feel better. Yeah, and I've, I've definitely been there myself for quite a few years, um, not just with alcohol, but with drugs and food and, I mean, all, all kinds of things, because it was that, that thinking behind it. And I, I did lose connection there for a little bit. My computer had to restart, so I think we might have lost the first 20 minutes of this, but that's, we'll, just, we'll continue where we're at. <laughs> now, um, Beth actually has her hand up with a question. Uh, you are unmuted, Beth. Go ahead. Okay, go for it, Beth. Yes, I can see it now. Can you hear it, Beth? Uh, let's see. I think we're, she's we reading her chat, I believe. Yeah, she can't. Yeah, we can't hear her. Um, so let's see. In the chat, she says, <clears throat> Sally, I find that trusting God for each and every step is absolutely indispensable and the only way I can survive. How does innate health relate to that in prayer? I'm referring more to under-earning, under-being, wasting time. Having never chosen a profession, and now I'm in my late 40s and artistic, how can innate health help? I'm assuming that's what you wanted in there. Um, I'd rather think and viscerally visualize positive and don't want to eliminate that tool. I'm not sure my mic is working. Can you see my chat? There we go. <laughs> no, your mic isn't yeah. working. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, well, actually, um, AA was the place that showed me my higher power, uh, which you might call God or anything um, greater than myself, was my understanding that there was something there. And I still hold on to that, but I now call it universal mind because the universe to me is listening. So I do speak to God, the universe, and ask for help and guidance and that's very very powerful to me and i think that's what what saved me that day when i called the ambulance i cried out for somebody to help me i can't do this anymore um so yeah i strongly believe in that um sorry what was the other part of the question uh she's she's mostly oh, interested in like under earning <laughs> under being wasting time kind of procrastination not choosing a direction in life type of thing. And I'm sure that, I'm yeah. sure a lot of us have some experience in that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I used to always be, be um, you know, criticizing myself and wanting more, expecting more. Um, but I find now, um, I don't berate myself for any of my past and I don't predict into the future. I live everything I can in the now because the now is all I have. Um, 
and I think yeah the lady said about positive thinking I do believe it in that too you know they say that the three principles is not a doing but I I do do things um, you know if I go off into my head thinking about something negative I will use a distraction um, but then that's just getting me out of my own thinking by distracting myself with something else walking the dog or whatever it might be that's not harmful to myself um, because I realised that a drink will only take me back to where I was and in fact I never want to drink again I have no desire to drink um, but yeah it's it's very easy easy for us to criticise ourselves I mean I'm not working at the moment um, but I have no thinking around that because I just know with confidence that something will come from the universe and I always wait for wisdom to speak to me it's like my gut feeling um, you know if I if I sit down and think I've got to do this I've got to do that I know I'm going the wrong way that it will naturally come to me what I need to do that's right for me I don't know if that answers any of her questions if you could type in the, the text box um, I know for me, I spent quite a few years while I was actively using just, I really had no direction. I never stayed at, a, at any job for more than one or two years, um, mostly because I would always end up getting uh, upset with the management there or something because they just didn't see how wonderful I was, <laughs> you know, something like that. But I spent a lot of years having no direction. It wasn't until coming across the, the principles that I really started choosing any kind of direction at all and that happened for me <clears throat> just by getting to that point where I was allowing my, my thinking to slow down and I know that there's a you know there's a common idea in the in the three principles community that there's no techniques or anything like that but, but you know especially when you're new to this it's helpful to do things like meditation and hobbies and yeah. anything that helps to slow down your thinking. It helps yeah. to, it helps allow that wisdom to come in. You know, that, that yeah. wisdom is available to all of us at any point in time, but it's just covered up by our thinking. So if meditation works, we have gardening works, if hiking, biking, exercise, you know, anything healthy works for you, do it. But, the key is to realize that the good feelings that you're getting from it are coming from you. And that action that you're doing is only helping to slow down your thinking. It's helping you, you just, it's almost like a de-stressing thing. A de, you know, stress is just more thought. So if, if, you're, if you're letting the thoughts just kind of slow down and fade away and, and not have quite as many of them, you're much more likely to hear that wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, in the beginning, I used to do all sorts of things to try and get quiet mind. And that's where, you know, the power is. If you can find quiet mind by doing whatever, then that, as you say, that's when wisdom comes forward. Right. And she's saying, uh, let's see. I think I still need tools as I shared with Greg offline. My approach would be to pray to God for a good day at my current job. Trust that I'm there for now for a reason and that if I relax, God will show me what to do next step by step. Glad to hear uh, meditation. Glad to hear about meditation since in the beginning innate health sounded very elitist, negating anything else. Uh, and she hears about slowing down the thinking, but are we aiming for that or just the realization that our thoughts cause our thinking? That's a, that really, I think, is the, the main, uh, if there is a main point to the three principles, I think that's really where it's at. What, what do you think, Sally? That last part there, are we aiming for slowing down our thinking or just realizing that our thoughts are causing our thinking or feeling that our thoughts are causing our yeah. feeling? Yeah, that the, it's a hundred percent our thoughts cause the feeling. 
and yeah, slowing down our, our, our thinking just gives us peace of mind and we're able to see. When we have really busy mind, we have very low levels of consciousness and you just can't see through the fog. And if, if you need a tool, like, like mine is lying in the bath and I lie in the bath with the music on and naturally now I can get quiet mind and that's when all my positive good thinking comes where insights about what I'm doing you know and where I'm going in life suddenly oh yeah you know it all starts coming in floods whereas if I try and do something with busy mind nothing seems you know to work out um so yeah it's, it's the realization for me that just pure purely our thinking uh, gives us our feelings and then our life experiences a hundred percent all of the time. And Sidney Banks actually was, uh, he was a proponent of meditation and anything that helps slow down our thinking that, that was yep. healthy. That being said, other things that slow down our thinking are things like drugs and alcohol and sex and gambling and food, you know, overeating stuff like that. It's all, things that we do innocently to try to slow down that thinking even just for a little time. But we're yeah. not, we're not taught growing up that we can just go there, that we don't need all of these outside things to go there. So when we're, when we're just being exposed to the, the concept of, you know, of the, the three principles, it's such a, a bizarre thing to hear that we don't need to do anything. <clears throat> so the, the, doing things like meditation and hobbies and whatnot can help kind of bridge that gap in between. Just realize, like I said, while you're doing those things, it's not those things that are giving you the good feelings. It's your thinking. It's your thinking about those things. It's your thinking about that walk in the park. You know, it's a, it's your thinking about that good workout you just had. You know, it's, that's, that's where it's coming from is within you. And that space of peace and contentment is our natural state of being when we stop doing all those things that take us away from it. All that, with all that cluttered thinking out of the way, that's just our natural state of being. So it's not the, the act of meditation or the act of gardening that is actually causing that. What that's doing is it's kind of distracting us from our thinking. And it's allowing us to yeah. return to that, that home base, that you know, that, that, that place that, that we're going home. I've always loved that. And the, yeah, and the principles, when I hear people talk about coming home. Can I come in the comment? Absolutely. Okay. I think it's because uh, when we're in the box, we don't, we can't think out of the box. So, so in, in a way, when, when I'm thinking about what, you know, if meditation becomes a task, now I should do it twice a day and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, you know, and I start evaluating what I'm doing. That just adds to the thinking in the box. Right. So, so uh, the principles are pointing to the formless and kind of the miracle or the, the thing we can't put into, uh, can't really put them into words. So it's more like the crack in the egg or <laughs> where the lets the light come in. And that's really difficult to put into words. So, so in a way, it's like um, um, aha moment. It's like giving yourself, allowing aha moments to happen. And um, that would, for me, another way, I, I was uh, severely ill at one time and, and uh, you know, really broke down and suddenly I saw the humor of life and my pity me, poor pity me. And I had this epiphany, which was certainly not anything I could have, you know, worked on or trained myself to do or it just happened. Uh, so, so this, this thing that really changes us profoundly, uh, as I also heard you said, Sally, it's, it's just, I said, it, it just can happen. And it can happen if we're open to it. So for me, it's like being open to, to, uh, to, to something different. And I know a lot of people meditate, meditating for years and they're still aggressive and have problems and, 
and this <laughs> so it, it it's it's good to meditate i do that too but it's not the meditation it's what comes before where it all comes from it comes from the source or a source that we can't really fathom uh, as i see it so but that's just my take on it uh, wonderful to hear you sally thank you chris you too <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Chris. That was, that was an excellent point um, that it's really not the act of meditation that's doing the work. It's there's something much deeper to it. And it's funny to point that out. There are people who meditate on a regular basis and they're, they're not happy people. So obviously it's not the meditation that's doing it. It's, it's a, that's a tool. And how you use that tool is what creates your experience of it. And it's all through our thinking. I think the most, the most the addiction really is we, we get addicted to our thinking patterns. Yeah. So it's right. a thinking, yeah. it's a thinking pattern. And, and if we can get, get addicted to meditation, what, you know, it's like, uh, uh, we, we want something to happen and we repeat doing it and we kind of jump to conclusions that, you know, I must feel better because I did that, this and that instead of just letting life be life, you know, accepting that we go up and down, that we feel good, we feel bad, we feel good, we feel bad, that it's all a natural flow, and, and that, that life is actually happening through us. I, I don't have to do anything to, to, to live my life other than be present, of course, and do, do normal things. I don't have to do anything special so in re re reality, the principles are pointing to being ordinary, <laughs> just being, you know, no big deal. <laughs> and I, I was in, in Salt Spring Island with Elsie uh, um, and Chip, and they said, well, just go out, live your life, you know, stop talking about this, you know, you know go for a walk. Yeah. Because it's, it's not an intellectual thing. No. So, yeah. I agree with you, Chris. Yeah, just just live it because you're living through the principles, you know, 100% of the time. It's just knowing it. Yeah, beautiful. But I mean, I still get, everybody still gets pangs of anxiety, fear, anger. But it's now for me, the realization of seeing where it's coming from. You know, if I get a feeling of anxiety, I have to stop and think, now, where was my head? when I got that feeling and I think, ah, you know, I was fixating on whatever it might be. My car's broken down or whatever. Um, and it's the realization for me that that God, it was all coming from my thinking, but it's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to feel angry. It will pass, you know, my thinking, the next thought will be about something lovely and I'll be back up again. <laughs> So, so basically, you don't have to be a control freak. <laughs> no. It's not good for you. No. I just live my life, as you say, moment to moment now. The obsessive thinking has gone totally. I don't obsess, obsessively think about anything, you know, which is fantastic because I don't hold on to thought. Just let it flow through me. And that's actually something really important is realizing that these thoughts, everything just flows through anyway. Unless we decide to put more thought on top of a thought on top of a thought. We keep adding to it by, by worrying about it. And it's, and I, I know I've said this quite a few times, but we didn't have to do anything to make the thought pop into our head and we don't have to do anything to make it go away. It'll just happen on its own. And I don't believe that any thoughts are necessarily good or bad. They're just, some are more comfortable and some are less comfortable than others. They're all just neutral. And they all pass. You know, and I, uh, this really hit home for me the last uh, four, four and a half months here uh, since my wife unexpectedly left. 
you know, it was it was quite an experience for me. All the the thoughts that I got caught up in for the first like month and a half after she left, and and then I just I woke up one day and realized I was creating all of my own suffering. I mean, I'd I'd heard that before and I'd intellectualized that before, but I I woke up and literally saw how I was creating all of my own suffering with my thinking, and most of that is through expectations. Mm. You know, we have expectations on what kind of job we should have, where we should be living, what kind of house we should be in, what kind of car we should be driving. There's all these expectations on life. Then when those expectations aren't being met, then I'm going to have a temper tantrum. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a beauty to life without holding expectations. Just going in to experience whatever is there as it is. And that's the, really the biggest lesson that I've learned out of this whole experience. And it's, it's really made my life just tremendously more enjoyable. Yeah, it's, it's accepting what is, you know. And it's like, I, I don't know, earlier uh, before we started the recording, we were talking about temperatures and what's warm and what's cold and what's, you know, what, what I considered to be kind of cool was warm to you. So even something that we consider to be very static and very uh, factual as, as temperatures is really not. It's all part of our own, our own experience of it, our own perception of it. Because, uh, you know, something like Tom, I think Tom's still on here. Tom loves it when it's, you know, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I, you know, I like to stop at around 85 or 90 at the, at the top. So what he calls hot, well, it probably doesn't exist for Tom, but <laughs> what I call hot, he calls cold. So if you look at, it, at an old mercury thermometer, everything is all on the same scale. There's really no difference between hot and cold except the labels that we apply to it. And there's no difference between good and bad thoughts except that we label them as good or bad. They're all neutral. Just like whatever the temperature is now is just the temperature. It's not hot, it's not cold. I might be more or less comfortable with certain temperatures just like I am with thoughts. There's some that I'm more comfortable with and there's some that I'm not. And some people handle things differently. So I try, you know, I, want, I try my best not to label those thoughts that are coming into my head, not to label these experiences that I'm having. They just are. They're all neutral until I put thought on them to make them good or bad. Hey, Greg, I have a question for Sally. Absolutely, go for it. Yeah. Hi, Sally. Um, you said a while ago, and, and I think that's great, that you don't want to have a drink anymore. Um, how, how long after you were exposed to the principles was it that you started to feel at ease and, and feel that way uh, and lose some of that anxiety around where you were going to get the next drink? Because I've been there, too, and went through rehab. And, and now, um, I guess after I got home, there was a period there that was very um, difficult for me to sort of find my equilibrium again. Uh, it wasn't all about, you know, where the next drink was coming from because I was sober, but there was a, a period there that was not very peaceful emotionally. And I just wondered how long that lasted for you if you had that same experience. It, well, it, it probably, um, I mean, things started to change immediately, really, in the first month of seeing Jacqueline but it, I still attended AA for another year because I believe that would be the only thing that would keep me sober not realizing that it was only me that could keep me sober um, and I came to my own realization that AA was actually keeping me in the addictive thinking because I kept calling myself an alcoholic four times a week to everybody um, labeling myself as one and I suddenly thought well how can I be an alcoholic I haven't had a drink for a year this is ludicrous the only time I ever thought about alcohol was when I went to AA 
um, you know, so it's a great, fantastic organisation, but it was damaging for me in the end. It was going against what I knew to be true. Um, and it, it did take a while because as soon as something came came upon me that gave me that feeling of dis-ease um, that I'd wanted to fix, then naturally alcohol would come into my mind because that's all I've done for 40 odd years was use alcohol. Um, and when I realised that the feeling would go change through my thinking without the alcohol as a fix, you know, it gave me such power that I had the power um, to fi fix my feel, not fix my, yeah, fix my feelings through my thinking, not through drinking. So I think everybody has different stages because it's, it's, you, you know, I clung on to AA because I was frightened to let go because I thought I would relapse without AA. Um, so it's different periods of time. I mean, I've actually repulsed myself against alcohol now, which I actually did, which was a doing in the beginning. Every time I looked at alcohol, I made myself heave and feel dis-ease. And now it becomes naturally, if I see alcohol, I actually feel um, quite ill, quite sick at the thought of it. Um, but I don't know, it's different for everybody, but I think it's once you realise where the cravings are coming from is purely from your thinking. I think that's uh, an interesting thing. I know it, it would be an individual thing, but uh, we have a conference call that that I call into every week and the people that are just getting out and moving back into their lives after being exposed to the three principles. For me, it was about a month before I sort of came to that level um, where, I mean, moods go up and down and everything, but you can sort of come to the peaceful conclusion that things are going to come back like they need to. And, um, and I just wondered how, how that was for, different people because talking to them it, it helps them to know that that there is a period like that and there is a time when that's going to go away it, it just depends on the individual's insights i mean a lot of people um because um they're used to different paradigms they try and intellectualize it and understand it um and don't see the simplicity of it you know thought feeling experience to me it's that simple um so i think people that intellectualize it um take a lot longer to have insights about just how simple it is but the people that i've seen everybody that i've taught um has had an insight about their experiences of life and suddenly where it came from and that it has nothing to do with anything outside themselves it is a hundred percent coming from them and that that is one of the hardest things to accept about the three principles is that we're completely 100 percent responsible for our experience of life it looks so much the other direction I mean, that's what we're taught our entire lives. You know, I was mad because that person did something to me. I was hurt because they, you know, felt they didn't follow through with their promise or something like that. It, it's not what that person did that you're actually experiencing. It's what you think about what they did. <clears throat> and there, there was a quote I read, and I, I'll paraphrase, and I can't remember who, <laughs> who the quote was from, but it said that uh, if... If circumstances had the power to bless or to harm, that they would bless or harm all alike. So the very fact that <clears throat> we can have different experiences of the same circumstances means that we create our experience of them. Otherwise, everybody would have the exact same experience, and we wouldn't need food critics and movie critics. We wouldn't need any of that because everybody would have the exact same experience. 
So it is only through thought that we can experience anything, even if it doesn't look that way. And that's really what we're talking about in this addiction series. I, you know, I know it's called addiction, but it's, it's really an addiction to thought. It's habitual thought patterns. And that would be, uh, it would be what they call subconscious thinking, which seems to be out of our control. But all it is is, is thought patterns that we've practiced over and over again until they became automatic. And it's no different than when you get in your car and you start driving. When you first learned to drive, you had a lot of things to keep track of. Check your mirrors, check your speed, check, you know. It, you had to remember to do all of that stuff. But at some point, you'd done that enough times in repetition over and over again that eventually you got in that car and you didn't have to think about those things. You just automatically did them. It's the same thing with any other type of addiction, even an addiction to underachieving. As, as silly as that may sound, that's really what it is, is just those thought patterns. At some point, I started thinking a certain way and I did it over and over and over again until it just became what I considered part of who I was. And I, I'm a people watcher. I, I am. I, I love just kind of observing. And I love when I hear people saying, that's just who I am. I can't change that. It's not true. It's not who you are. It's, it's something you do. It's a habitual thought pattern, period. And that's a good thing. It's good news that we are creating all of our own suffering. It's good news that we create our own experience of life because that means we can change it. We don't have to wait for our circumstances to change. You know, there's, I still keep in contact with a couple of people I knew in AA and there's, there's one guy in particular, he was a multimillionaire at one point. He'd started an Apple uh, uh, computer store when, when, you know, Apple computers were just really coming out. And, it, you know, he did sales and service and everything, and he grew a really big business out of it and was making a lot of money. And his drinking and drug use and, and whatnot caused all that to go away. And now he's living in a small apartment on, on government, <laughs> government subsidized housing. And he's happier than he's been in his entire life. So you can't tell me that circumstances are what creates our happiness. I've seen way too much evidence to the contrary. Yeah, I agree because I have I have less than what I had, you know, twenty years ago. I don't have a job and what have you. Um, but I'm the, the most content and happiest I've ever been in my life with nothing material, just my you know, being and just being happy with me for the first time in my life and who I am and knowing that I am innately healthy and perfect just sitting here now in this moment. Great. It's a beautiful thing. Does anybody else have anything? Any questions, comments? Text. Okay. Oh. Oh, never mind. Never, never mind. Never mind. Oh, your mic's working now. Go for it. It is. Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me. Yeah. Oh wow! Hi everybody. Thank you. Okay, I was just texting. Like, <laughs> okay. Now I just I'm still not understanding how I still don't I can't quite grasp this whole thing, and I I still feel like I want direction, and coming from a religious background. Um, I just quit, still don't understand how, to me, when I want something to get done, I, I talk to what I call God about it and pray. And then, and then I learned a whole course on trust from my religious background and, and then trust that and anticipate good, God willing, meaning revealed good, and that things will happen. Um, 
I, I still don't understand how innate health is anything more than just a neutral state as opposed to a positive state. It just seems like, I just don't get it. I think I just don't get it. And I've tried to read books and they don't go in. And I, you know, different things to speak to different people and I just don't get it. And different authors speak to different people. Maybe I'm not really listening with my heart. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you have something, Sally? Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, um, yeah, everybody um, has their own beliefs. And um, my God is uni the universe. And I still talk to the universe. But I often laugh and think, well, I'm actually talking to myself because I have I have it within me to make my day as it is. Um, but if yeah, if people pray to God and get some sort of peace of mind from that, that's finding the quiet mind again, where all the wisdom comes from. But I think maybe you are trying to intellectualize the three principles. I mean, it is just so basic when you see it that every experience you have can only come from your thinking nothing or nobody can give you an experience of life. Right. And the neutrality of it is really actually, and I, I had similar thoughts about it when I was first introduced to the principles, you know, what's life like without the really happy, 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 you know, all that chasing the, the excitement and the happiness. What I ended up finding is that in that neutral place is, is peace and contentment. And contentment, to me, is more enjoyable than any of the really exciting things that happen. Not that I don't enjoy those things, but and they still happen. But realizing that it's just all part of the ebb and flow and that, that, that place of neutrality, that, that contentment space, is our home base. That's our default setting. And anything else we experience is just, you know, variations on that. But it's more of just noticing that central place. It's not about avoiding any of the other stuff. It's just noticing that that place is always there. Whether I'm up here and I'm really excited and happy and having a great time and I'm at, you know, a concert or I'm at, you know, something, I have something going on where I'm really enjoying it. Or if something that I perceive to be bad happens and I'm down here somewhere. And I'm stuck in my thinking about, you know, negative things. Even like, you know, these past few months have been, you know, very trying on me, but even in, in the lowest times, I could feel that that place of neutrality, that place of contentment was always there. No matter what else I was experiencing, I could always return to home base. I don't know if that makes any sense. What's in my head and what comes out are often two very different things. So. I, I kind of hear what you're saying. I just, I, I can, can I be heard? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I wrote, I guess I'd, and this may be judgment, I'd rather be manifesting what I think is my soul's potential than in a job that I feel I'm not good at at all and I'm stuck in and why am I schlepping you know, from New Jersey to Brooklyn every day just to make money for something that I, that I don't think I'm, you know, that has nothing to do with my talents and my interests and in my humble opinion, who God made me to be. Now, it's, I work with very nice people now, which is a huge changeover from about a year and a half ago, um, maybe two years ago. And that's great, but it's very upsetting when I'm with 27 year olds who are like 20 years younger than me and they get the stuff because they have business brains and, and they're just, this is what they like doing. And they just like stuff in general, I think also, but I, I'm not, I'm, I'm good at certain things and I'm not good at the other stuff. And it's just very frustrating. And so to me, it's about prayer and trust and listening, I guess. I don't, how, going in neutral to a job that I feel is not, okay, I guess the feeling is a thought that I feel is just so 
challenging, meaning I'm boring. I don't find data interesting. I find it data entry. I just find saying the same thing again and again and again boring. I'm a creative person. I really don't enjoy it, but I have to learn to enjoy things. And I've never enjoyed working and I've never taken life seriously <laughs> between the 13 or 15 of us. So, and as an, again, as a religious person, that's not good either. And I also got a very sad health diagnosis um, that I just had two surgeries for and I feel great, thank God, but the follow-up is not pleasant if I choose to do a Western route. And like all these things, I would much rather visualize positive, feel it in my body that I'm healthy and I'm manifesting a life that God has intended for me. And I just find, I just like it. I feel that that can change my immunization, immunity. I can, you know, I can like, it puts a smile on my face and then I'm actually happy going to work. Why would I just keep in neutral? That's my question. I see you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just, uh, I, I was just, uh, is it okay? I, I was just, um, I'm from Denmark, by the way. Hi. And we have this uh, um, Christian uh, um, uh, philosopher called San Kierkegaard. And he, he, said, he said that uh, prayer doesn't change God, it changes the, changes the person that prays. True. That's the point. So, the point is, that when you change uh, your thinking, your experience changes too. So, uh, so when you get humble, uh, and, and let go of your resentment or anger or whatever it is, and uh, see it with other other people with love, ah, you feel better. You change it. Now, when we do that, whatever we call it, it, it gets better. And it gets better because there's a logic to how we experience that the principles are explaining. Uh, so it doesn't really matter if you're a Hindu or Buddhist or Christian. It's all the same, really, because we experience through, through our thinking. And, and that's just one metaphor pointing to a truth that is a metaphor, yeah? Anything we say is a metaphor. So it's pointing to the truth that, that when I get, when I change my way, wow, you know, have, have you ever experienced suddenly experiencing that, that the people you prayed and you, whatever you did, and then those people that you were, you were angry at, whatever, they start acting differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, how, how come? Because somehow or another, um, something in me changes and the world responds in a different way. Or is it me changing? I think it is, yeah. And I suddenly can see the positive in something that I couldn't see before. I don't know, but for me this, uh, this um, what I like about the principles is that, that, that it's really just so, just a simple, you know, Sidney Banks, the guy who saw the principles or fo formulated them, he was just a simple working welder, <laughs> never read any books, and uh, it's, I suddenly saw something in a different way. Well, not from me, and uh, good questions, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. I think this might be a good place to wrap it up. Do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom, Sally? <laughs> no, I don't. I just hope that, um, you know, you, you've got something from it, even just a little insight maybe. But any of the questions, then uh, Greg can give you my contact details. I'm happy to do private Skypes if anyone wants, you know, me to talk more. But just thank you for and Sally is on Facebook. So if you want to get a hold of her, you can look her up on Facebook and get a hold of her that way. And you actually have your email on as your uh, your username on here. So Sally Wise at hotmail dot com. Is that still the current one? Yeah, yeah. So there's another way to get a hold of Sally if you'd like to. Um, and that's 
Sally Wise, W-Y-S-E, at Hotmail.com. But definitely thank you so much, Sally. This has been awesome. Such a great conversation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody so we can all say goodbye. And uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Sally. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Take care. Good week. I'll call you when I come to England.